I want to congratulate you on the awesome job you did exposing those dangerous pirates. The whole country is on fire. Are you ready for your next assignment? Yes, Charlie. Now, these ones are more dangerous than land pirates. These are blood-sucking vampires that come to suck the resources out of your country. I don't do land pirates. Yeah, I can't stand a man with bad teeth. Ladies, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to stop these vampires from sucking all of the oil from beneath our ocean. Ladies, are you ready? Ready. Ready. The Bahamas isn't only brimming over with natural resources. The Bahamas is a natural resource. Over the last few episodes, Bahamian Evolution has investigated some of our natural resources in our country. We have shown you the value and the day-to-day -day essential usage of some of our resources. In this episode, we are going to investigate oil. Yes, the Bahamas has oil. Oil has made many countries around the world wealthy. But many people believe that oil is only used to fuel cars, electricity corporations, and generators. However, did you ever stop to think about the many uses oil has in our day-to-day -day existence? Oil gives us hot water, heated homes, but oil is so much more. Did you know that everything from your jumper to a DVD to a scented candle comes from oil? Even a water bottle bubble gum and the detergent you use to wash your clothes it is the fuel that let us take to the skies and sail the seven seas oil even helps to keep us safe and healthy without oil hospitals would not have such refined products as everyday clothes and nylon bandages essential devices such as saline solution bags and surgical tubing everywhere you turn oil is playing a part in our lives even a simple stroll down the street is improved by oil. The salt under your feet, the traffic lines painted in the streets, all brought to you by oil. And of course, where would we be without the gasoline and lubricants that we use to drive our vehicles? Oil really is a fascinating product. In this documentary, we will learn whether or not Bahamians can benefit from their oil, what are the advantages and disadvantages from drilling oil? And who is digging for oil in our waters? And does the Bahamian people have a say? Find out in the documentary. And remember, every Bahamian is a millionaire. Nineteen eighty-six. Lyndon Penland gave Tenneco permission to explore um, seven oil wells. In a period of two years, they documented some seven, some 17 point um, four billion barrels of oil. See this document there? Mm -hmm. This is a document from Tenneco internal audit report showing all of the oil fields and their locations and the, ex the depth to which they um, um, dug for the oil, the names of the various areas that they have um, um, examined, the report showing um, the amount of oil in the various traps. The oil fields in the Bahamas are as big as those in the Middle East. God has given the Bahamas oil in the quantities some people say exist. 
it would be an incredible bounty for our country. But we took a position that, that if there is going to be the exploitation of oil in the Bahamas, it has to be done with the consent of the Bahamian people. Oil. Oil, otherwise known as petroleum or crude, is a thick black liquid composed primarily of hydrogen and carbon. The physical properties of oil, such as its thickness, vary greatly depending on the specific combination of hydrocarbon molecules. Oil also contains trace elements of sulfur, nitrogen, and oxygen. Today's oil deposits were formed millions of years ago when dead marine organisms sunk to the bottom of the ocean bed and were buried under deposits of sedimentary rock. After subjection to intense heat and pressure, these organisms underwent a transformation process by which they were converted to oil over millions of years. This is why you may have heard oil referred to as a fossil fuel. Oil is found in underground geological formations called reservoirs. The rocks found in a reservoir have various physical properties that allow them to hold hydrocarbon reserves. Through exploration activities, such as seismic, surveying, rock core sampling, and other advanced technologies, geologists locate oil reserves. Oil is extracted from the reservoir most commonly by drilling a well. Once recovered, oil is transported by pipeline, ship, rail, or truck to a refinery where it undergoes a complex refining process that creates petroleum products like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, asphalt, and many more. In our daily lives, we interact with hundreds to thousands of different objects that were manufactured by humans, a combination of many different natural materials to form a brand new creation. Because of this, it becomes rather easy to overlook what exactly the things we use every day are made of. Today, let's clear up a few of those mysteries and talk about what products we use in our daily lives are made from petroleum. The petroleum refining process is the chemical engineering process and other facilities used in petroleum refineries, also referred to as oil refineries, to transform crude oil into useful products. Gasoline is obviously going to be the first thing that comes to our mind, but petroleum is surprisingly used for much more than that. In a standard 42 gallon barrel of petroleum oil, roughly 19 and a half gallons of gasoline are created, so over half of the barrel ends up being used on other products. On the topic of transportation, crude oil is also used in similar products such as liquefied petroleum gas, gasoline or petrol, kerosene, jet fuel, diesel oil, and fuel oils. However, your car is using crude oil as much more than a fuel. Petroleum is also found in tires as well. Petrol oil is very prominent in the production of rubber, which just so happens to be the entirety of what a tire is. In the entertainment business, petroleum is used to create a clear plastic coating on the bottom of CDs and DVDs. When you see light scratches that can be buffed out by a machine, these are often scuffs on the petroleum coating and not on the disc itself, working as a shield against the horrors of being slid across a coffee table. Here's where the uses of petroleum spread significantly further. The petroleum isn't just featured in the plastic coating of CDs, but in most plastic produced in the entire United States. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, say that three times fast, plastics are made from liquid petroleum, liquid natural gas, and natural gas. To rattle off a few, this means petroleum can be found within shower curtains, fishing boots, toothbrushes, movie film, balloons, refrigerators, and way, way more. The usage doesn't end at plastic and oil though, because petroleum can be even traced into the food that we eat. Packaged baked foods contain petroleum as a method of keeping them fresh and resisting mold. Petrol is also found on the waxy coating on most chocolates, the dyes used to color processed foods that we eat, and the preservatives found within many different types of canned food. Yummy. Hopefully this opened up your eyes a bit to the many uses of petroleum in our daily lives, as a massive amount of the things around us contain petroleum or were created using machines that use petroleum. As a final interesting parting fact, Studies show that if humanity's rate of consumption remains the same, the oil between the Earth's surface would last about 50 more years before running out. So now you see that oil is used for everything. I mean, it's even in your food. It's in the clothing you wear. Oil is everywhere. 
And so now what we're going to do is we're going to explore some other countries that went from being very poor countries to being very wealthy countries. We're going to explore some countries that went from being uh, developing nations to being developed nation by using their oil. And we're going to show you how they used it not to empower their government, not to empower foreign companies, but to empower their people. And after that, we're going to let you hear from our politicians themselves about this battle over our country's oil. And yes, they did go to war over our country's oil. Oil-producing countries all over the world are able to tax foreign companies and foreign entities that drill, explore, or produce oil from their countries in order to benefit their citizens. This is seen in countries such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the UAE. You are going to hear a little bit about how their oil benefits their citizens and you're going to see just how much tax is collected from companies that produce oil or gas, refine oil or gas, or explore for oil or gas. In today's world, oil plays a big role. Countries that have oil reserves manage to become incredibly rich in a period of short time. Today, these countries provide a high standard of living to their residents. Saudi Arabia's tax structure was amended in January 2018. Any companies that are engaged in the production of oil and hydrocarbons have a tax rate of 85% for capital investment of $60 billion or less, 75% for companies with a capital investment between $60 billion US dollars and $80 billion US dollars, or 50% for a capital investment exceeding $100 billion US dollars. In the 1970s, the rights reserved for oil and gas reverted back to the state of Kuwait. It is among the seven richest countries in the world in terms of per capita income. Kuwait, there is a huge amount of oil which makes the country one of the richest in the world. Oil in Kuwait is cheaper than water. People have very high standard of living. If the citizens of the country who want to study abroad, the government pays for everything from flying to studying. The country's currency is the most valuable in the world and there is one servant or maid per local. Huge oil reserves allow them to live and not to deny anything. There are no taxes in the country. There are huge benefits for children and for divorced women. The United Arab Emirates uses Abu Dhabi's income tax decree of 1985 to establish that any exploration and production companies are subject to tax according to their income. If they receive an income of 5 million Arab Emirate dollars, they can attract a tax of 55%. However, it also states that the tax can be 56% or more. Another Gulf country which over the course of several decades has turned from an oasis into one of the most developed countries with a high standard of living is United Arab Emirates. 9 million people live in the country of which only 2 million are citizens of the country. The rest are foreigners who came here as workers. When the Emirates authorities found oil 60 years ago, they wanted to get rid of the oil needle as quickly as possible and built the incredible city of Dubai. The country has a very high quality roads, no corruption, no unemployment and very high salaries for residents and for foreigners with higher education. At birth, the state opens an account for each child and by the age of majority, it has about $100,000 on it. A young family receives from the government a plot of land and about $20,000 for a wedding. Here is life in a country rich from oil. Considering that oil has brought major benefits to each of these countries, is it possible that the Bahamas can get into the oil industry? Should the Bahamas get into the oil industry? And lastly, is it possible that the Bahamians can benefit from the oil? 
Let's find out. It is interesting, Mr. Speaker, again, from this uh, uh, mining industry, according to the budget, we've only earned $70,000 for the year from aragonite and sand mining. That is incredible, Mr. Speaker, and certainly is unacceptable. And so one of the things that we would want to know as Bahamians is what is the deal being contemplated? What is the royalty being contemplated from this potential oil source? Are we going to strike a deal that is going to be beneficial to the Bahamian people and tied to the, to the, the value uh, of the resource? Not only the actual value, but the speculative value. Because one of the things that uh, has happened that the Bahamian people have not been able to benefit from is the fact that BPC is traded on the, I think, the London Exchange. And if you've watched the share price of BPC move, it basically moves as there is an announcement from the Bahamian government uh, on a position. And so you've seen that price go way up and it's come back down a bit. But the only people that have been profiting from that speculation has been foreign people. We should have already been tied in. If we are serious about this and we're going to do this, we should have already been tied into this and being able to appreciate or to, to, to benefit from the appreciation of this stock. But that's the kind of thinking we have to do, Mr. Speaker. We can't just look at the back end. We have to be looking forward, looking at creative ways to create wealth uh, for Bahamians and for the, the, the sovereign or through the sovereign wealth. This was in 2015 in the House of Assembly when the Deputy Prime Minister was still in opposition. What he is saying here is that already, before any oil is found, our oil is being traded on the markets. The company is being traded on the markets. And so money is already being made by foreigners, by the owners of this company, and by anyone who is able to trade. But guess what? Anyone is able to trade around the world except for Bahamians. And so this is a disadvantage that we have to pay attention to. And so that was the Deputy Prime Minister advocating for Bahamians and saying that we should have already been connected and able to benefit from this. But of course now he's been in government for three years and he's done nothing towards that. In 2006, five licenses were granted to BPC, the Bahamas Petroleum Company. Ironically, the Bahamas Petroleum Company is actually a foreign company, and we're going to find out exactly what they intend to do in the Bahamas and how much the Bahamians get from this endeavor. We're looking at, uh, we're looking for an extension of the, uh, the Cuban uh, oil fields into Bahamian waters, uh, and uh, we need many ingredients to come together in time and space. Uh, but we need a source rock, which is clearly working uh, to generate the oil fields in Cuba. But then we need a reservoir uh, and a structure uh, in the Bahamas, which is the container that we would hope that the uh, oil is uh, filling up to provide the uh, commercial reserves that would be necessary for an oil development here in Bahamas. We've spent uh, over $50 million looking for those okay, uh, ingredients. While the exploration of oil has much potential, to change our entire nation, here is what Adrian Gibson had to say. At present, BPC has convinced the government to agree on the sweetest, dumbest deal that any government could purport to be negotiating on behalf of the citizenry. I feel intellectually insulted partially since the royalty rates preferred, according to the proposed production license, are the lowest in the world. The licensing agreement between BPC and the government states that the oil royalties would be dispersed on a sliding scale. So essentially, if 75,000 barrels of oil are produced daily, the royalty rate would be 12.5%. 12, 12 More than the 12.5 to 25% slap in the face, BPC has, given, has been given five licenses to drill in an area spanning nearly 4 million acres at 92 cents per acre per this project. year. The Member of Parliament asked a great question. 
Why BPC? Why now? Why would you change the Petroleum Act that was established so long ago and replace it with this one? Why is BPC so significant to the PLP as they are implementing this new Petroleum Act in 2015? Our investigative team was able to find out exactly why. The leader of the opposition, a former Prime Minister, who is seeking to once again become Prime Minister of the Bahamas and hold a high office, has publicly stated that he is a paid consultant for a foreign oil company. The company is seeking to explore and drill for oil in Bahamian territorial waters. In Friday's Nassau Guardian, the leader of the opposition said the following about his involvement in that foreign company. I quote, I consult and work the firm dames I'm qualified by the office I've had, with the knowledge that I have in terms of government, end of quote. The foreign oil company is seeking government approval to drill an oil well in Bahamian waters by next year. Mr. Christie's deputy leader, his law firm, is also involved with the very same foreign oil company. Mr. Jerome Gomez, the PLP candidate for Galani in the general election was the same foreign oil company resident country manager before it set up its own office in the Bahamas. My fellow Bahamians, the approval for drilling for oil in the pristine waters of the Bahamas is among the most momentous decisions that any government of the Bahamas will ever have to make. The decision by your government should never be influenced by any financial relationship that exists between the company seeking the permit and its paid consultants and attorneys. During the 2015 Petroleum Act debate, Perry Christie was accused of having a conflict of interest as he was a prior consultant to BPC before establishing this Petroleum Act in 2015. So the question remains, why was the Petroleum Act being revisited? Why was it being reestablished? Let's take a look at what Perry had to say when he was accused of having a conflict of interest. Just before the Prime Minister took the office of Prime Minister for the second time, he was the consultant to this company. Now his cabinet sits to determine what is going to happen with this very same company that they're going to give licensing to for the exploration. That in it fact is the conflict. It was those remarks by MP for Long Island Loretta Butler-Turner that sparked a war of words across the House of Assembly Wednesday. I regret with respect to Mr. Speaker that amongst the advice I gave that particular company was to go to another law firm. And that is the law firm of Higgs and Johnson. The company is also acted for by Graham Thompson, where another attorney general served. He fired back at Butler Turner and said that when members opposite speak of conflicts, they should consider this. Conflict is when someone serves in a capacity as a minister and then immediately after election served as a consultant to the company he gave favor for as a minister. That happened on that time. That's what conflict is. That's what conflict is. That's what member, you, member, that is what member. conflict is. I disclose what I do. Yes, I represented oil companies before. But that's not an issue here today. I'm not dealing with any oil company. I'm dealing with the reforming of the, of the petroleum industry. And so with all of the government's objection about this oil deal uh, from the Member of Parliament for Long Island's full article showing all of the disadvantages of this deal to other mem members of Parliament in the opposition uh, government at the time, speaking out against this, the question is, why didn't they do anything different? Why didn't they make a change? Uh, let's hear from Perry Gladstone Christie himself. If we had it all wrong, why did the member and her colleagues agree to extend the licenses in the exact same terms? In the exact same terms, including the exact same financial terms. 
Not one change, Mr. Speaker. Not one change. Why did she do that? If it was so wrong for the PLP to have done it, why didn't they stop it when they had the chance? Why did they instead extend the licenses? However, if we are going to answer the question to whether oil exploration in the Bahamas is going to benefit the Bahamians, we first need to see whether BPC, since it is the oil company that was proposed and that currently has licenses, whether they will be able to perform the task at the best possible capacity, and also whether they will be able to honor their contracts. Will they pay their royalties? Let's take a look. On May 25th, 2020, the Tribune published in their editorial a very interesting commentary about the Bahamas Petroleum Company. The news that the Bahamas Petroleum Company has not paid its licensing bills for an undisclosed number of years did not come as a shock. It is exactly what I expected from them. What did surprise me was that the government accepted a mere $900,000 to cancel the bill, which was surely in millions of dollars. And what was really astonishing is that BPC admitted that it used money from Bahamian investors to pay it. As far as we know then, this foreign company itself has not invested anything, just ducked their bills and license obligations for several years, then got the Bahamian public to bail them out, shortchanging our public treasury in the process. Boy, if true, these fellows are slick. The Member of Parliament, Peter Turnquest, addressed this very issue during the 2015 debate of the Petroleum Act. And so the question is again, what are the promoters of this industry willing to put forward or guarantee the Bahamian people? Are they willing to put up prior to drilling? Are they willing to commit to training our people? One of the things that struck me, and I've heard this uh, here I think today, about these jobs that are going to be created as a result of this activity. Well, from the, from the discussion that we certainly attended with, the, with, with BPC, they indicated that there wasn't going to be very many jobs for Bahamians. They said there may be some welding jobs in the beginning while they prepare the rigs, but after that, the only uh, uh, Bahamian jobs that may exist may be a couple jobs in Andrus where they intend to put a, uh, um, a supply depot. But there will be no real jobs because the goods will be, be delivered by a helicopter and uh, uh, so there may be, a, uh, when the ships come in, there may be some, some offloading or stevedoring type jobs uh, there, but not very many. And so again, if we're risking all of this, all of our environment and the thousands of jobs that are, are, are um, <coughs> created through tourism and the environment, are we really willing to risk that for a couple of jobs? And so this document is a BPC document where they were filing to be able to issue some more shares in their company. And they wanted to issue these shares to go to particular persons, to their directors. And of course, we know that one of their directors is a Bahamian, who used to be a government minister. And again, we can't infer anything, and all we can do is look. But here, we see that the directors had decided that instead of some pay, they decided to defer 20% of their salaries and fees. Um, and that was in 2014. And then in 2018, the, the same directors decided to defer 90% of their salaries and fees and have it uh, given to them in shares. And so when we look down here, we see that James Smith was entitled to get 9 million shares. 9.2 million shares is what they were going to give him in addition to the already 2 plus million shares that he already had. And so in total, uh, James Smith is going to get 11,475,630 shares, over 11 million shares. 
And so we don't know what that really means, but we know that the company is selling, their shares are selling right now at the time of this recording at 2.53 Great British Pounds. 2.53 Great British Pounds per share. And so if you times 2.53 Great British Pounds by 11 million, 11 point, by 11.4 million, you get 37 million, 877,813 dollars and 31 cents when converted to dollars from pounds. And so, of course, the actual value will be determined by the actual value of the shares, which could go up or down, or maybe different than uh, what we reported. But all we can do is look at the documents that are before us and come to a conclusion. And we encourage all Bahamians to look for themselves. And so we're not inferring anything by this. But what we do know is that while they're talking about these oil rigs that they're going to have to put up and, and then the exploratory, ex, exploratory drilling that they're going to have to do, uh, oil rigs are already erected in the Bahamas, right outside 8 Mile Rock in Grand Bahama. They're there. Our team actually flew over there and took these pictures. Here, in back, 8 Mile Rock Freeport, the two offshore oil rig set up. We speak out of the pole out. That a vibrant, a valid effort was put into the cleanup at Prince William Sound in Alaska. But 26 years later, 26 years later, some effects are still to be seen. Some fish that were present are no longer in existence. Fishing volume is now down. And Abnormalities within the fishing industry, the fish themselves, are noted, Mr. Speaker, and the area <coughs> is still not properly cleaned, Mr. Speaker. It's still being cleaned up. There's also work still going on in the Gulf from the disaster that had occurred. I'm going to ask, how can a conscious people <clears throat> and a vigilant opposition trust the government. When there's a petroleum disaster, they'll be on a BC, Clifton Pier, and in the bay. At Clifton, there's oil visible at spots. And if they can't clean up Clifton and the BC disaster, can you truly believe that they can manage the entire ocean? Mr. Speaker. We must consider the importance of the environment and the many Bahamians who make their living from this resource. We must ensure that we do not authorize any new industry that will harm the number one pillar of our economy. Today we have sun, sand, and sea. If we have a serious disaster, we will be left with sun. Think about it. Mr. Mr. Deputy, also there's a high risk. These jobs tend to be high risk. Workers find themselves at, in risky situations. There's also issues with the food chain and the fish that we eat. It is inevitable that a small amount of oil will be spilled into the ocean regardless during the drilling. This oil contaminates the water, which in turn contaminates our fish. And it may start with small fish, but the few remnants will remain in them. As it moves up the food chain, the contamination may dwindle, but Mr. Deputy, the fact remains that it will still be present. While well, the Bahamas Petroleum Company is set to begin its oil exploration next year, but the move still not sitting well with environmentalists who are seeking to increase the pressure on government to step in. Our Janelle Longley has more on this tonight. When we hear things like, oh, don't worry, this is just a short exploratory well, 
um, that raises some flags for us from a safety perspective, um, because it was while Deepwater Horizon um, well was being capped um, that the blowout preventer failed um, and that there was oil gushing into the water for, for over 80 days. Local environmentalists want you to know that damage like this is possible if government does not intervene before the Bahamas Petroleum Company begins its oil exploration in 2021. Aside from an online petition garnering nearly 40,000 signatures against the process, the Bahamas Reef Environmental and Educational Foundation has also recently launched a video campaign as environmentalists suggest, the country might be weighing over its head. What we're doing is we're comparing ourselves to other countries that have been a part of the oil industry for so long. It's something that we're definitely going to risk um, so much for so little. There also hasn't been any public communication about what um, the benefits really could be to the Bahamas and um, any meaningful discussion about these risks and who would be bearing these risks. During the 2015 debate for the Petroleum Act, Perry Gomez explained that the measures that will be taken in case of an oil spill is that whichever company is responsible for it will firstly take all of the responsibility and they must clean it up except if it happens accidentally, which of course he will outline, and in either case, it's regarding funds or them having to go to jail. It doesn't actually affect. Are we really ready for the kind of cleanup that this is going to take? The Horizon oil spill alone took 42,000 people to clean up. Is the Bahamas really prepared for an oil spill? or any damages that may occur as a result of drilling? The potential impact of exploration and production activities must be considered in the context of national and global protection policies and legislation. I am pleased to note, therefore, that the bill takes into account the environment in which the petroleum operator functions and requires him to take precaution to avoid environmental damage. Environmental damage, Mr. Speaker, related to petroleum production can lead to potential human health exposures, which may negatively impact human health. It is pleasing to note, therefore, that this bill makes certain that a company which holds the exploration license and production lease shall be strictly liable for these damages, except in cases where it is demonstrated and proven and the damage arose from a major environmental incident of unforeseen causes, and where the holder of the instrument has undertaken all reasonable preventative measures to reduce and mitigate the environmental damage. Is there oil in the Bahamas? Possibly. We have five wells already. But is it worth risking what it would take to get that done? Is the Bahamas ready to respond to an oil spill? Can the government be responsible enough to monitor any drilling? And is there any company that is worthy of receiving a lease or a license to drill or mine the oil from the Bahamas? I'll let you determine your answers to those questions. Mr. Speaker, I want to refer the clause 19. The Prime Minister had noted that he would do a referendum. And clause 19 is very important, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister said before oil, drilling, extraction, a referendum would be done. The clause 19 states where there is discovery within an, within an area under license. The individuals shall be entitled to be granted a lease. So, the Speaker, that's contradictory. The law here say that they shall, they are entitled. So, that referendum that was promised was another false promise, Mr. Speaker.
Before I close, Mr. Speaker, I want to refer in January of this year, in January of this year, seven licenses were issued. Seven licenses were issued with grant approval for drilling. Those were Atlantic Petroleum Limited and Bahamas Exploration Limited. The speaker, these licenses, these companies are held in the registered office of the Deputy Prime Minister. But what is most important, Mr. Speaker, what is most important, the principal of the companies in question, the two companies that were given seven licenses, the principal of the companies are Mr. John Rainwater and Mr. Ryan Bateman. Ryan Bateman, principal of a company that was given license to drill within our waters, a warrant of, of arrest has been issued for him by a foreign jurisdiction. But yet, we are going in bed with such individuals. The speaker besides that, the individual who is the principal owner of the companies that were given seven licenses in January of this year, not only has a warrant of arrest been issued for him by a foreign jurisdiction, wow. and he's absconded, but he's welcomed in the Bahamas, but he is a broker, Mr. Speaker, nothing to do with oil. He's a broker. And also, as you review, you would note, Mr. Speaker, that he's made it to take clients' money, place within his own account, and inform the clients that their money, they have no more money. I, I know of the gentleman that the member for Kalani speaks of. Uh, but with relation to the companies that he refers to, I find it of interest because it was their administration who accepted $720,000 from both Mr. Rainwater and Mr. Bateman when they were in power to begin the processing of the applications. It it, so it began under their watch. They processed the applications, held on to the money, Mr. Mr. Speaker, from two thousand and eight almost three quarters of a million dollars they held then indicated to the gentleman that they lost the checks and asked them to come back with fresh checks in january of 2012 which they deposited again for the purpose of proceeding to process the applications so this is something, the draft licenses, the leases, everything was in my file, Mr. Speaker. So I don't want the member to sit here and say that this is something that this administration began. This began under the Free National Movement Administration between the years of 2007 to 2012. The gentleman who they referred to, Mr. Bateman, the word for his arrest was not issued until 2014, while they were in. 2014. They issued the license in January 2015. What I would like to see us doing is taking advantage of this reduced oil price to invest in more green technology. Because the price will eventually come back up. There's no doubt about that. It will eventually come back up. But and so we should be taking advantage of, of, of this time rather than um, um, talking about investing and drilling and all the rest of this, about trying to see how we can encourage more investors in green technology because it has long-term benefit for all of us. With the alternatives being mentioned, the question remains, Will our government take advantage of the opportunities that they oppose the PLP with? Or will we remain in the cycle of PLP versus FNM? Both repeating the same steps, the same mistakes.
now we can ask the question why don't we own our oil so my question is if we could not go into this industry ourselves because uh, we don't qualify we don't have the money or the equipment or the expertise then why was BPC allowed based on everything I'm hearing them say they didn't have the money they didn't have the equipment listen carefully with me this morning from Bahamas Petroleum, I'm joined by Eitan Uriel. Eitan, good to see you again. Good morning. Oh, hi. We're back. <laughs> We're back, indeed, virtually back. Look, big morning here for, for the company, the drill rig contract. That's been signed for Perseverance. Tell us a bit more. So, uh, as people who watch this regularly will know, I mean, we have been planning and preparing to drill Perseverance 1 in the Bahamas for quite some time. So, uh, we've been working the market. The market for drilling rigs has quite changed quite substantially in the last few months. Prices have come down, availability has gone out, up. We were able to uh, reopen conversations with a number of partners and very happily today we finally closed a contract. It's a firm contract for a rig from Stenner Drilling. Stenner Drilling are one of the world's uh, foremost uh, independent rig providers. It's a brand new, it'll be one of, you know, state-of-the-art sixth generation rig. And, uh, and yeah, so we've signed that today. We're incredibly pleased. It sets the clock running really for drilling again. So the reality is BPC also didn't have the oil rig and a certain equipment to get this done. They came in, made a deal with our country, and then they had to go and lease the equipment or find the equipment somewhere. And so if they were able to do that, why couldn't we do the same thing? So again, it's not about the equipment. So maybe let's look at the cash now. The other thing that I guess people on this uh, forum will be very interested in is the funding. And uh, our funding strategy is unchanged. We have cash in the bank. We have two uh, lines of funding that were established. Uh, one with uh, one with a conditional convertible note with investors in Australia and one a, um, a convertible note structured finance arrangement with uh, a high net worth family office in the Bahamas. Uh, in March, we went and rescheduled both of those to the end of the year. Um, they are both still there, both available. And as we've said publicly many times, that gives us the confidence of knowing we have the money we need. So BPC, claims to have 11 million to 12 million dollars in the bank that's what they uh, claim to have uh, in several occasions speaking to investors they also claim to have arranged a line of credit you may call it from an australian institution and so that means that they're basically getting a almost like a loan with credit from this institution to be able to draw down on to be able to have access to more money and so they originally said that this was going to be about 16 million pounds but we see documentation where it's actually going to be around 10 million pounds for this drawdown now for the rest of the money they said that they're also getting some money from a bahamian family that's very curious which bahamian family has millions of dollars to just give to this company and why would a bahamian family just give them the money uh shouldn't we if we have that kind of money just do it ourselves and so the question here is do we know our value so apparently this company doesn't have the equipment they had to go and lease it they didn't have the money they had to go and find it and in fact they're still trying to get this money straight because the documentation shows that up to this month they didn't have the money in hand to drill the well watch this and so our investigators found another document uh, and this shows that up to this month they were still trying to get the money straight in order to do this in order to start drilling by the end of the year and so here's where they filed that they're getting a convertible note, or let's say I'm going to call it a line of credit, it's some credit in order to get this done, some money that they could draw down from. And as you can see right here, this is the 20th of October, 2020. So up to this month, they were still trying to get this thing done, get this straight. And so 
And so here we see that they are trying to get 10.25 million pounds, all right, to add to what they have from a syndicate of Australian-based investors, okay? And so, and, and, and it's, it's towards the cost of drilling Perseverance 1 in the Bahamas. So in order to do this uh, 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 exploration, they still, they're still trying to get the money together in order to do it. And so that's what this is, is all about that's that's where we are so the question is how is it that so-called foreign investors can come in to our country without the money to get things done but they tell us that we can't do things because we don't have the money it's because they use our ignorance of how business really works in order to keep us down they make us think that if you don't have the money you don't go into business but the truth is what you need to come up with is not money what you need to come up with is vision and you sell that vision to an investor and that investor invests in your vision and they invest in you that is how business really works next week ladies and gentlemen is the grand finale we're gonna answer the question what now what next you're going to hear from the other side. You're going to hear from professionals in the, history, in the industry who have a history in this industry. And you're going to see some more documents that's going to blow your mind. A document that has been hidden up to this time. The document that we couldn't find anywhere that makes it all make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, the grand finale.